So as we were doing the book of Nehemiah, we've been in Nehemiah lately. Scott had taken us through it, and I thought to myself, after he was done, we can't not get to chapters 8 and 9 in the book of Nehemiah because these are some of the greatest chapters in the whole entire book of Nehemiah, in my uh, opinion. But my goal today, as I said, is to lift your thoughts above the circumstances in your life. I think Sam Walters was here two weeks ago, and he talked about that, about how Jesus sometimes was able to rise above the, the trivial arguments that were going on and the trivial things of this world. And he was able to ri raise above that. And that's what I hope to do today. I'm going to get you to lift up your eyes. And Isaiah, many times he tells them, lift up your eyes and look into the heavens. Who created all these things? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and his mighty strength, not one of them is missing. And so when we lift our eyes up out of this world for a temporary period, we can forget all that's going on and we can get hope for a future that's bright and glorious. And that's what I hope happens to you today. So let's bring ourselves, since some of you may not have been here for all the, the sermons on Nehemiah, let's just get started, get everybody up to speed uh, the book of Nehemiah, when you look at it on the surface, it seems to be a book of the history of rebuilding these walls in Jerusalem. And so you can look at that, but I think if you look at it that way, you'll miss a lot of the deeper truths that God had put into this book. In, in my mind, this book contains truths about a sin-cursed world and all the trials that we face. I think if you read this book, everybody can... Uh, uh, understand the trials and tribulations that were going on with Sanballat and Tobiah and all that was going on. But it also contains principles of what often appears to be really subtle interventions by our God into our daily lives. And these interventions, I say, sometimes can only be seen on retrospect examination of your life and looking back. And I think we all have stories like that, right, where uh, some point in life you look back and you say, wow, God was really in that, and I didn't fully appreciate it all the time. But today I also hope you can see that this book contains a truth about the end of all things, maybe a slight glimpse of what awaits for us in heaven. That's the idea here. So how did Jerusalem get in such a mess? How did this happen? Why did Nehemiah even have to build these walls? Really, we learn about this in the, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 25, if you want to look along. I'm going to be reading some verses out of there, the first 10 verses or so. Uh, this is what Jeremiah told the people. So Jeremiah the prophet said to all the people of Judah and to those living in Jerusalem, for 23 years, from the 13th year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until this very day, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you again and again. But, just as that street preacher, you did not listen. And though the Lord has sent all his servants, the prophets, to you again and again, you have not listened or paid any attention. They said, turn now, each of you, from your evil ways and your evil practices, that you may stay in the land the Lord gave you and your ancestors forever and ever. Do not follow other gods to serve them and worship them. Do not arouse my anger with what your hands have made. Then I will not harm you. But you did not listen to me, declares the Lord. And you have aroused my anger with what your hands have made. And you have brought harm on yourselves. Therefore, the Lord Almighty says, because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. I will banish from them the sound of joy and gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the sound of the millstones, and the light of the lamp. The whole country will become desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. 
And so it was in 600, around 605 BC, the first round of judgment came upon the land and the Babylonians in, invaded. But what was the requirement? What did we hear in these verses? What was the requirement to stay in the land? It was simply, do not serve or worship other gods. You know, this has always been God's command for us. If we want to stay in his good will, we would, if we would have obeyed uh, in the beginning in the Garden of Eden, we'd have been there forever and ever, but we did not. So nothing has really changed, even for us. What is our requirement for us to stay in this land the way that we are is we cannot bow down and worship other gods, and we cannot provoke God to wrath with, with the things we've made with our hands. And so it happened. Uh, everyone was scattered off to Babylon. They went, and they stayed there for 70 years, and now the 70 years is up. And so I could imagine if I was in that land at that time, I'd be like, wonder what God's going to do. Seventy years are up. What are you going to do, God? Well, if he'd been in uh, modern culture, maybe I'd think, well, maybe God's going to set up a GoFundMe page and uh, get me back into the land of, uh, uh, of Israel. Or maybe I'd think, well, God's going to raise up some, some Jewish celebrities and they're going to sing a song called We Are the Captives. And we're going to raise awareness and he's going to bring us back into the land through these mighty acts. Or maybe he would get some kid to kind of go on Minecraft and rebuild the walls virtually. I don't know. Maybe that's what Simeon would do. But no, what did he really do? And this is what he does over and over again. God moved on the hearts of a few men and women who then in turn moved on the hearts of other men and women and so on it went until this great event happened. But look who God uses in some of these events. One of the guys that they use is this king who is a Persian king, complete pagan guy. His name is Cyrus. You know, I would be just as surprised if today God used Billy Ray Cyrus to kind of uh, fix our achy, breaky heart, right? But no, he used this guy Cyrus. It says in Ezra chapter 1, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, meaning that 70-year return, the Lord moved on the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm. And he put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a temple. At Jerusalem in Judah. Now you can go out through history. You can go out and there even find on the internet this thing called the, 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 the cylinder of Cyrus where he carved all these things. And you can read that, that cylinder and you can find out Cyrus was still worshiping, you know, Marduk and all these other gods. But yet God still used him. A, a pagan uh, king he used in order to bring the people back into the land. And it's just a reminder, even in this, these times that we're in and things seems, our leadership seems to be a little crazy in this country, in my opinion, that God can use anybody to bring back revival to the land. So God used the pagan guy, but he also used just ordinary people. Zerubbabel, Sariah, Mordecai, Mispar, Rehum, and this guy Nehemiah who was uh, a long way away from Jerusalem. So here is another truth in this book that God often uses a small group of people to accomplish big tasks. We know that from the gospel story, right? Jesus focused on 12 men who then went out and focused on other people. And we're here today in this very auditorium because of that, the obedience of those 12 people. Amazing. I had a friend who uh, passed away. Many of you know him in this audience, Chuck Herman. Firefighter here in town, really bold guy for Christ, really good friend. And when his uh, funeral came, in my opinion, way too early at the age of 50, uh, we showed up at the funeral and it was absolutely packed with people. And Chuck had touched the lives of many people. And I told my kids, don't think that one person can't touch the lives of many people. So that is another truth from the, the book of Nehemiah. But here's the Another big truth, and that is that once these people start the task, right, the opposition comes. And the opposition comes the same way today. They ridiculed them. What are these feeble Jews doing? 
Even if a fox jumps on that wall, it's going to fall down, right? That's what they said. They ridiculed them. And that same for us, too. You know, what are these crazy Christians doing? Do they really think their God is coming back? Scare tactics. You know, the, the leader said, oh, hey, you guys are rebelling against the king. Meaning, you guys are in trouble. You're rebelling against everything that's, that, that the society holds as the norm. And that's going to happen more and more to us as society takes more and more biblical truths and they say, well, these aren't the way we think anymore. Right? We're going to look that way. Distractions. Uh, come to the plain of Ono, Nehemiah, and we'll discuss what's going on about this building of the wall. Right? I was talking to Craig Frist this morning. I was saying, you know, the same thing happens in my life. I get distractions at work. They want you to be on this committee for, for medicine. All these things that can distract you from doing what you need to do. And then finally, false messages. Remember, the, the men came and said, Nehemiah, they're coming to kill you. Run into the temple and hide. So the same thing can happen to us. But they were faithful and they kept on working. But think about the work that they were doing. I can only imagine being there working on this wall. You know, the, some of the people were out front. They were picking up one heavy stone, putting it up on the next one, another stone on the next one. Sort of mundane work in some way. And you could easily say that, well, geez, is God really in this work that I'm doing? I'm just picking up stones and putting them on the wall. They still had hardships, right? They were taxed excessively by their own people. Some of their kids went into slavery. They were working with their swords on the side because they were under threat of the enemy. And they still had to balance work-life issues just like we do. They had to keep, keep on keeping the Sabbath. They had to make sure their children were taught, their children were fed. The ladies had men clothes. Guys are fixing broken tools. Their kids are still getting married. And babies are being born. And I know that because I just became a grandfather this weekend because of a baby being born. But is there really nothing new under the sun? Yeah, thank you. A great grandfather is a great thing to do. Yes. But is there anything really new under the sun? Has this really not been the, the story for ages to come? Can you relate to these circumstances? Have you ever sat down and thought, well, geez, why, oh God, this life seems pretty mundane to me. I seem so powerless to impact our world. God, are you really watching? Have you ever had thoughts like that? I have them all the time, uh, especially lately. It's like, wow, what is going on in our country, God? I think of the psalmist in Psalm 73 who wrote this. His name was Asaph. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, they seem to have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the common human burdens. They don't seem to be plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride becomes their necklace, and they clothe themselves in violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and they speak with malice and, malice, and with arrogance they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues possess the earth. Therefore, people turn to them and drink up their waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. They seem to be free of care, and they go on amassing wealth. Surely I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. And when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. So what is the end of all of these matters? You know, someday we will finish this work, just as they did in the book of Nehemiah. Eventually, the work is finished. In Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15, we find out, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elu in 52 days. Quite a miraculous thing for such a wall. And they said, when all our enemies heard about this and all the surrounding nations became afraid and they lost their confidence because they realized this work had been done with the help of our God. The same thing is coming for us. Someday we will finish our work here. Jesus finished his work here. 
In John chapter 19, it says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And we all know that there's a final finish coming, right? Revelation chapter 2, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things have now passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. So we know, all of us, the blessed hope that's coming, right? The blessed hope that's coming. All these trials and tribulations, just as a, a woman in tri uh, childbirth has all those pains and tribulations, but when it's all over, that baby's here and it all seems worth it, right? All seems worth it. And this was the conclusion of that psalmist who was wondering, was troubled by all these things that he was seeing and the wicked prosper. This is what he said. I, I questioned all these things until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny, right? It's the final destiny that we're all working towards. You know, sin uh, in this world has the pleasure up front and payment after, where righteousness is the exact opposite way. The work comes up front and the payment is later. And so we're all looking for that time. So let's go to Nehemiah chapter 8, and we'll finish here, because what I want you to see is this gives me a little taste of what will, what will all this thing be like? What will the end of all these matters be like? So let's go to Nehemiah, and we're going to read in chapter 8. I'm going to start in verse 2, and I'm going to skip some verses along the way. But I want you to listen to these words and imagine those days when your work is done and we enter that kingdom for our final resting place, what will it be like? So here in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 2, it says, So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women, and all who were able to understand. Right? We will be able to understand because we've been given the Holy Spirit, and when we show up in heaven, we'll understand these things. You know, the, the Old New Testament puts it this way, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Verse 3, he read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of all the men, women, and all others who could understand. And all the people listened intently to the book of the law. Can you imagine how focused you'll be when you show up in heaven and start looking around and seeing all the things that are going on? And Ezra opened the book, and all the people could see him because he was standing above them, and he opened it. And the people stood up, and Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, amen. Then they bowed down, and they worshiped the Lord with their faces on the ground. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving meaning so that all the under people understood what was being read. I can only imagine when I show up in heaven and I see all that's around me uh, lamenting some of the opportunities I didn't take here on earth, right? I would say, boy, if I had known this was what was coming, I would have been bolder. I would have been more uh, on, on fire for God, have more zeal. Then Nehemiah the governor, I'm sorry, in verse 9, then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or do not weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. I could imagine when I show up in heaven, there'll be a moment where I'll want to weep because I'll be like, ah, oh, man, I fell so short down here on earth. But our gracious and marvelous God says, do not weep anymore. This is a day holy to the Lord, for the joy of the Lord will be your strength. And the Levites calmed all the people, saying, be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Can you imagine such a thing? Are you not looking forward to such a day as that? Our eyes will be opened. And we'll see our shortcomings, as I said. 
And then tears and regrets, though, will be all wiped away because our God is not a God who's interested in just punishment. But then what happens next? And this is the, the, the part of the book that I really, really want to focus on. This is the testimonies of God's work in the lives of the people. Move forward over now to Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 5, and we're going to talk about what's going on here. And the Levites, Jeshua, Kedemiah, Benai, Hashbaniah. Well, I'm going to have a hard time when I'm there in heaven pronouncing all their names. I'm going to have to ask their names several times. Odei, Shabaniah, Pathiah. They said, stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessings and praise. There's a verse, one of my favorite verses in the book of Isaiah, talks about the final days, and it says, in that day alone, God will be exalted. I won't be up here on the platform. Believe me, on that day, I am not coming up on that platform. God will take the center stage, and there'll be no man between uh, God and us, and we will worship him. But listen to what they say. So they're not really in heaven. They're just in a picture where God has restored their their town to them, their city to them. But the blessings of the people, the praises of the people start to flow. And listen to what they say in verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens and all the starry hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that are in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you, you are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of the Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful and you made a covenant with him to give him the descendants and the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. You saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt, you heard their cry at the Red Sea. You sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his officials and of his land, for you knew the, arrogantly, the arrogance of the Egyptians and how they treated them. You made a name for yourself which remains until this day. So there's one thing you should see in here is the word you, 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 you. I dare say none of us will ever use the pronoun I in that day, right? I made a great uh, life for myself. I uh, solved all these problems at Mayo Clinic, and I, I, none of the I's will be there. It'll be you, 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 you. What a glorious day that will be. So this week, as I was preparing for this sermon, I thought to myself, what am I going to say when I get there, right? What am I going to say? And I think that's the challenge for us all this week is to sit and think about this. When you are in that position, we will all be there. Even the most stoic among us will not remain silent. I guarantee it. The praise will just flow from our lips. But what will our message be? What will your message be? I walk around the house sometimes. I'm thinking, what am I going to say in that day? What, what am I going to bless the Lord with? Because we're all going to do it. And in that, right, when you get that focus, when you have that focus... All of a sudden this week, the, the tribulations and trials of this world seem to pale in comparison to thinking about that day, right? Uh, a lot of things happened that worked this way, a lot of troubles, a lot of complaints, a lot of trials going on in my life. But I thought, man, God, I can't wait till I get to heaven and be able to praise you and sing your name in front of everybody. And I think in that, I think, is our challenge for the week, you know, if... If you're here and you're listening to this message and you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Am I really going to be in heaven? Is this really real? Do I, am I really going to show up? Are we really going to be here just as we are as this congregation right now? Will we really gather in heaven? I'm telling you, we really will. And things will be so much different, right? But they can be different now. You can, you can start rehearsing your testimony now and bless yourself <laughs> by thinking about these things as you uh, spend your quiet time with the Lord this week. Think about those kind of things. What am I going to praise the Lord with? And when you find yourself doing this, 
you'll find a lot of joy coming back into your life.